Well, everyone, welcome once again to RDA Tech Q&A. You've got questions, we've got guesses. We're here to answer your various and sundry tech. God damn it, go away, car. We're here to answer your various and sundry tech-related questions and also look at a little bit of the news for the past two weeks. Um, with me, as always, is uh, my producer, Mike Gearman. He has a uh, long history in the tech kind of stuff, and as do I over... 10 years and Grady is over. What are you, Grady? What are you doing? See, when you turned there and the cable coming from your ear just came perfectly on screen, it looked like Grady was dragging the cable. Do you hear this? Yeah, I can hear him fine. He's, he's great. His levels are perfect. Can I just do the show, buddy? Why are you, he's been, ever since I got back, he's been yelling at me. I was gone for a week and he's just been either screaming at me or purring at me or purring and screaming, which has resulted in a cat that can quack. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing. Do you, you, have, you, should, you should tape that. Do you have to sharpen your, your talons right now, Grady? All right. You're going to sit and you're, you're going to go to sleep. You're going to go to sleep. All right. I've got to answer tech shit. So. Let's look at the news from the past. There's supposed to be a quiet breed. It's supposed to be a quiet breed, yes. Ragdoll is supposed to be a quiet breed. Bullshit. Um, looks like our levels are okay. Everybody uh, out there, do our levels look okay? I don't know if you if they even know what the hell I'm talking about. Do you even? Does we sound good? Do you even DB meter, bro? I was wondering if you were going to try to make that tortured joke. I, I was, and I did, and it happened, and you can't stop me. Okay, so let's get into the stories. First up, everyone in America right now is is looking to Google as though they... The, Google is broadband Jesus right now. Yes. Please, please come to our town, broadband Jesus. Even if we don't get you... You will make AT and T and Verizon and 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 whoever else is here drop their rates to something approaching reasonable. They lower their prices, then other people have to compete. They yes. don't want to do that because then they lose profits. So companies like AT and T and and uh, Comcast are trying to use a little bit more. Do you want to run the show? Maybe if you picked him up. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Come here. Come here so you shut the fuck up. Come here. Ugh. I have to do... You're, you're tangled in the wires, Grady. Come here. <laughs> Come here. All right. Now, will you shut up? Will you please shut up? Thank you. So... What uh, some of these companies are doing are trying to use some legal end runs to get around some important aspects of allowing Google to do their rollout. For example, in order to roll out Google Fiber, Google needs access to utility poles, which I will point out are public property. And there is a process that has to be undergone when a new service is added to a utility pole. For some weird re archaic reason, if you add your service to utility pole, you can't move other people's wires out of your way. You can't like rearrange things yourself. No, no, they have to come. That service has to come out, move the wires. Then you get to put your wires in. It takes yeah. two service calls and maybe perhaps possibly if another company isn't really motivated to move oh, yeah. their wires. Now, and initially the way this article reads, it's not a, we want to put our wires here. You have to move your wires. It's apparently they have to move their wires no matter what. Doesn't matter who was showing up to put wires. It could be Comcast sharing the pole with AT and T. Right. They'd still have to move the wires. But there. I, I don't understand why it's you know the wires are there. We would just add our wires here. It, 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 it. But the the thing is the the other companies aren't particularly motivated to allow oh, a competition to come in. So Google has tried to put forth in Nashville a. Uh, uh, they're trying to push through a law that will that's called uh, one touch make ready. Make ready is when you add your wires to the pole so someone else can have access, so someone can have like internet shit. 
And one touch means instead of waiting for uh, AT&T to get off their ass and make room for Google on the poll, Google can just make its own room on the poll and proceed from there. AT&T is, of course, fighting this tooth and nail. Yes, they're under, under their justification, which sort of looks valid on the face of it, but not really when you think about it, mm. that, well, if they screw something up, we're the only ones who knows how to fix that. I'm going, well, like, it's cable. It's not that hard to fix. No, it's not. And, and I can, under, but I can't understand. If it, if it was strings of fiber everywhere, I'd go, okay, you have to have special fiber training. But in, in this instance, this is definitely, it is a valid excuse. It's just not an excuse I buy coming from a, uh, uh, field where companies notoriously attempt to shut out any and all competition. They have divided up whole geographical areas just to prevent themselves from having to compete. So, yeah. yeah. The, and the, the thing, uh, the article here says, okay, there's 44,000 polls that need this work. Right. Uh, 94, excuse me, 9,800 of them have been approved for make ready work, meaning other companies would have to do their part. Mm -hmm. But only 33 polls have been fixed. 33 out of 44, Thousand. Thousand. And AT&T has no impetus to do this. It's not in their interest to do so. They're, yeah. they're essentially, be, they're not getting paid extra for it. They're not, they're, they're going to lose money when Google Fiber gets installed. So AT&T has no vested interest in assisting this, even though those utility poles are public property. They are there. Well, to many of them, many of them. Yeah. Some of them apparently are owned by AT&T. Regardless, but governed under governed under the same agreement that they have to share the polls. Right. That that was the that was the concessions that were made that allowed AT and T to establish their business in the first place. Now that they've got theirs, they don't want to share. And it's it's I there are a lot of other little legal finaglings going on across the country regarding stuff like this, which is why we're having such a big fucking problem with broadband rolling out in this country. We literally, we have Google, a company that wants to build out its infrastructure, which is kind of amazing in broadband right now, a company that is willing and able to build out an infrastructure because the others sure as hell don't even like upgrading or even, even doing basic maintenance on their own infrastructure. So having a company that's willing to do it is incredible already, but they keep getting these roadblocks put in their way. Yeah, I mean, you look at other companies and they go, yes, we, we're going to roll out, uh, you know, fiber. Uh, oh, we did it to one network and we decided it was too much of a pain, so we're not going to do it anymore. Yeah, we're done. Now you have a co Google or not Or not maintain their copper lines. Or, yeah, oh, this, it's too expensive. We don't want to... Who uses copper anymore anyway? God, leave us alone. It's too much work. So this is the kind of shenanigans that are going on across the country between Google and AT&T and Comcast and Charter and any other company that feels like their stranglehold on broadband is potentially threatened. And it's frustrating as shit. Speaking of other well, things... Well, hold on. Frustrating as shit is a pretty good description of AT&T and Comcast. Yeah. So... I mean, I mean, it's not something their PR department is going to suggest as a slogan, but... AT&T. Frustrating as shit. Do -do -do -do. Now, um... Moving on to something that might hit a little bit closer than home, and I haven't seen one of these in a long time. There is a product recall out that you may wish to be aware of. I've seen recalls on my car a couple times, you know, fix the airbags. Not on electronics. It's been a big time. It's, it's been a long time since I've seen uh, this big of a recall for a, uh, a mainstream product that a lot of people are using. Um, Samsung this week is recalling the Galaxy Note 7. Galaxy Note 7, by the way, is the phone I was planning on upgrading to in a few weeks. That is now on hold. The, well, that's not happening. They're being pulled off the market. 
Yes, well, I'm going to look at other products. Yeah, something else. Um, that, it doesn't apply to their um, their other Galaxy no, phone. No, the, the, the Galaxy 7 and the Galaxy S7, or the, Gal the Edge 7, the are Edge still 7 fine. Is the But here's, here's, and here's where this headline is a little misleading. It says, Samsung is recalling the Galaxy Note 7 worldwide over battery problem. The no, no, no. Battery problem is it's not charging properly. Uh, it doesn't have the, the life that it's supposed to. Yeah. Battery problem is not, Nash. Catching on fucking fire! My, mine was going to be, I was going to say catching the fuck on fire. But we're there. We said the fuck. We said fuck and we said fire. That's the important thing here. Um, there, it, and because the uh, batteries are, it's, it's a lithium battery still, right? Lithium ion rechargeable okay, battery. Okay, so. Lithium ion batteries are, are known to be volatile when damaged. Mm. There's a, a fairly interesting video you can find on YouTube Gee, of a guy who you want you mention a video about uh problems with a battery on YouTube, you say? Gee, what do I happen to have queued up here? See, when people hear battery damage and same, fire... Same wavelength, same wavelength. When people hear battery damage and fire, they're like, well, it's just like a little spark or something. I don't think people really appreciate how much energy is contained in a standard smartphone battery. This will demonstrate it for you. Have a look. This is a... Uh... <laughs> this is a smartphone battery pierced by a knife... This is the one I was talking about. And if you watch, that's in your pocket, everybody. Um, was it again? I, I didn't see anything on my end. Maybe it's just me. There it is in slow mo. You can see the battery expanding. Oh, there we go. And kaboom! Big bada boom. Now you're saying, well, Nash, maybe that's not a phone battery. No, stop, 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 stop. No, you're I'm pretty sure that was a phone battery. You're saying, well, well, here's an actual Galaxy S4 battery hit by a hammer. Have a look here. Here we go. Grady, shush. Here we go. Got a Galaxy Samsung S4 battery. Here's a hammer. Smacking it a few times, still okay. Give it another good smack, still gay okay. Takes a lick and keeps on ticking. Yeah, there we're at number three, absolutely fine. Four hits. How many hits? Four, four. Oh shit, there it goes. Oh. Oh. So yeah, these batteries can be seriously dangerous you have yeah. one of these in your pocket by the way now i say i say they can that's, that, that, that's why i keep mine by the way in in my vest pocket normally in case i feel it starting to get warm really quickly it's right there i can throw the fucker has he been fed today it's, yes he's got food in his bowl right there Water. Got water. A small toy to play with. He's got toys. He's perfectly fine. You're fine. You're just being annoying. All right, fine. You're leaving the studio. I'm sorry. You're out. You're out. You're done. No, no. No, no. You're done. You're done. You're done. Let's put you out the door. Come on. You're done. You're done. Come on. Live, oh, everybody. Done. That's it. You're over. Bye-bye. Cut his mic. Cut his fucking mic. You're done. You're done. Screw it. We'll do it live. No, no, Grady does not need a web show. We, it would be a camera pointed at him, him yelling at the camera, and occasionally attempting to attack the green screen. So professional here. Now, th th what to appreciate is most laptop batteries, most cell phone batteries, tablet batteries, 
they are not inherently dangerous when they are handled properly, when they are designed properly, and yeah. when they are charged properly. And that's where the problem is coming in here. Yeah. And and, and, and also similarly with those off-brand um, hoverboard things. Yeah. Which had fires. That was a case of battery design and battery charging. They were the off-brand ones, to my recollection. Please correct me if I get this wrong, Nash. Had a bad charger system built in. It was supposed to charge much faster, so you could continue to play with your hoverboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just, you know, don't. There is a limit to how fast you can charge these things. How much energy you can put into them. How fast? You've got, you've got to design these properly because these are volatile chemicals. And you just saw examples of how they can be. Yeah. Now, don't worry if you drop your phone. It's it's not going no. to, you know, drop your phone. It's going to catch it. No, he I, had to hit, remember, he had to hit that with a hammer several times or stab it with a knife multiple yeah. times. So unless you drop your phone in front of a, a semi with that is rolling on rims instead of tires yeah. that pierces it, you're probably going to be okay. If your phone catches a bullet, saves your life, Set the phone down afterwards. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Now, the, the, now uh, Samsung is, they're allowing people to exchange for the, uh, for other Samsung Galaxy 7 phones, and they're offering them, good. they will allow them to trade in uh, for uh, the Note, Galaxy Note 7 accessories that are no longer, but they still, this is kind of a big ass inconvenience for people, especially, look, look at that, look at that picture down there. Of one of the uh, of one of the phones, that's what happened when the battery malfunctioned. Yeah, and that could easily be someone's house going up with it. So, if you are currently in possession of a Galaxy Note Seven, um, get the fuck rid of it. Go and exchange it right now. Uh, I, I'd recommend the Edge. It looks, it, yeah, it looks it looks really neat. Um, that is probably what I'm going to get in replacement for mine, unless between now and when my, my period, you know, uh, my trial, not trial period, the period where they say, okay, you can change it in for cheap. Uh, cause my contract will be up. Yeah. Uh, they come up and say, ah, oh, yeah, we're recalling the edge too. Cause it's set. Uh, now I have not think since they're the same family of phone. Um, uh, I'm, my question is. What's the battery difference between the two such that they're only having to recall the one? Well, I've, the Galaxy Note has a larger screen. So yeah, it, and it's got, I, th it, I think it has a larger battery. And I, well, But it also has, because it has the, the removable pin, pen, sorry, pen. Yeah. Uh, there's you know several design considerations with that. So the ba battery might just be differently shaped yeah. and just has a different uh, thermal profile. If you look at that, at that image of the, the burned phone, it is definitely burned on one side. Yeah. And that is the side away from the pen. I I, I can't remember. Well, it's the way from the pen on my phone. I don't know if they put the pen on the same side. The, I can't really tell. The last time I saw a recall like this was during Dell's shitty capacitor era. Uh, uh, was that the same battery recall Dell hit, did? Yeah, it was the battery recall as well. The, the, uh, okay. Okay. The, where you you had to go to their site and go, plug in my battery serial number. Oh yeah, that matches. Send me new batteries. Yeah, because this one, your laptop might catch the fuck on fire. And again, that was another battery issue. We, it's these are safe devices. You just have to engineer them properly. And it looks yeah. like in this case, they either made an engineering mistake or they got from a cheap supplier. Which again, that also hit Dell. They they bought a bunch of. Uh, Cheap capacitors. Do you remember that the uh, I forget what what model it was the the Dell workstation back in the uh, early mid two thousands that the black box with the gray front opened like an accordion. Uh, yeah, I vaguely remember it. Um, it was it wasn't wasn't one of the dimension models. I remember that. No, no, it was it was an Inspiron. Okay, and, and uh, they they bought a truckload of crappy cheap chinese capacitors and the motherboards were constantly dying yeah and they were constantly sending me out i worked for dell they were sending me out to replace those motherboards and they'd be fine again for like maybe six months and then the, the capacitors would go again because they were still using the same shitty capacitors 
So we'd have to go out again. It cost Dell millions of dollars in lawsuits and, and all lots sorts of goodwill. Yeah, you know, lots of goodwill. Yeah, which. And when we went, just, just just a side note here, because I had to take some electronics courses when I was doing computer engineering degree. When we talk about shitty capacitors, a capacitor is basically made up of two conduct two or more conducting plates with a material between them. Mm. And the material between them can actually just be air. Now, for computer parts, it's probably not. No. Um, and depending on the quality of that, those metal plates, what they're, you know, what the material is, how good the manufacturing process is, or the quality of the separating material, uh, the capacitor can be really freaking fantastic in the last 50 or more years. Or it can be the kind of thing that starts to swell the instant you start putting uh, current through it. Especially if they're, a lot of one of these things they, they do is they'll mislabel capacitors. Yeah, absolutely. And they'll label them as being higher rating than they currently are, and they can't handle the voltage, and the boom. Well. I want to say that we saw that with some electric guitars once upon a time, too. Well, moving along, um, this goes to, uh, we're still talking about phones. Um, Android has released the newest version, which is Nougat. Their previous one was Marshmallow. Now we have Nougat. And if you're wondering if you're going to be getting the upgrade to your phone, quite probably not. Um, the Note 7 might get... Oh, wait. <laughs> Part of the problem... This is this is becoming a serious issue. For, this has been an issue for Android for a long time. But in this particular instance, it's a bit of a serious issue for Android. Um yes. Android fragmentation is what's referred to the fact that you have tons of different phones out there all running different editions and versions of Android. Yeah. Now, this is this is further complicated. It's not just the chipsets of the phone. It's, you know, which is the guts of the phone. It's the different vendors. So AT&T and Verizon could be using the exact same chipset, but because they're different vendors, you know, AT&T could say... Yeah, we're not going to apply that laser because it's too much hassle redoing all our branded apps for that one, which people are slowly getting rid of. And Verizon might go, well, we we have enough of a user base on that phone. We're going to do it. It's well, it's also a matter of not just a matter of user base here. All right. Here's what has to go through. Let's give you the Apple example. If Apple wants to put out, push out um, an update to iOS, it looks at what phones they have, looks at what the hardware cap capacity are, and just pushes out the update. And it doesn't matter what carrier you're on, what, uh, what, what your plan is, any of that. It just goes straight out to them. Because Apple has standardized. iPhones are pretty much standardized. There are different yes. models. But Apple knows everything in those phones. Android is a little different. First, you have the person who makes the phone, be it Samsung, LG, uh, HTC, any of any of this, the phone Why? manufacturers. Right. You, you have, first you have your manufacturer. That's the first people who have to be responsible for the phone upgrade. Then you have the carriers, like Mike was saying. Each of the carriers gets their own special branded version of Android with bloatware installed as well. Their own little apps that you can never fucking uninstall. When I was with Sprint, well, they had this uh, this NASCAR app. I never wanted to use the fucking NASCAR app. It was like 10 megabytes. That was 10 megabytes of storage space I couldn't get back on a phone I purchased. Mine has an NFL app. Do I like football? Well, yes, I do. But if I'm, I never look up football on my phone. I'm home on Sundays. And yet, I wanna... you can't uninstall that app. Uh, well, well, okay, so technically you can, but you have to jailbreak your phone, which right. is beyond the scope of today's topic. And then the next level of this is the chipset manufacturer, the people who actually make the ARM CPU that is the heart of the system. This has become a little bit of a complication as of recently. Texas Instrument used to be a large uh, chipset manufacturer for a while, and then they dropped out of making ARM chipsets. Which, which I think was a mistake on their part, but hey. And that left Qualcomm as the largest manufacturer manufacturer of ARM chipsets, which everybody... And that's, and that's why I think Texas Instrument dropping out was a mistake, because let Qualcomm have everything. Yeah, everyone is... Many mo different models of phones, different brands, different manufacturers, different carriers, at the heart of them are all running, quite a few of them right now, 
are running the Snapdragon 800 or 801. Lots of phones still in service, including my very own um, uh, Google Nexus 5 from 2013. It's running... Or a, a Note 3. Yeah, they're, it's run, they're running the Qualcomm. Now, what has to happen for a new update to work on Android for for this is the Qualcomm has to make new drivers, test new drivers, and verify they're working and send them out. And Qualcomm has decided, nah, we're, we're not updating the Snapdragon 800 801 to Nougat. Sorry. Because the, uh, the newer phones are not using the 800 and 801. Right. And they're going, why should we do this? Uh, now, there is a way this could be solved. And that would be for Google to bring more of the Android in-house mm -hmm. and say, this is what we're responsible for. Everyone has to get this. And I think it's going to take a massive security breach on someone important. Yeah, here is the... Oh, excuse me. Hold on. Let, me say, let me correct that. On someone with enough of a um, pulpit... Not necessarily important. It could be Kim Kardashian. Here's where this is becoming a problem. Phones have reached the good enough stage. I have no real impetus to update, to upgrade my Nexus 5. It's still a very fast phone. It does everything I need it to. And I don't want to spend another $350 on a brand new Nexus. Agreed. Um, yeah, a lot of people feel this way about their phones. They have their phone. It works, does what they want. They don't want to upgrade. They don't want to be paying extra money for a phone. All of these Qualcomm, and there, where this comes in to be a big problem here is there are so many phones yes. using the 800 and 801 that upgrades aren't going to happen. And this becomes an issue because along with those upgrades, those neat new little features that Nougat might have, there's also security fixes. Some very important security fixes we should yeah. note i think we talked about those last time a little bit yeah you do not ever let any kind of operating system lie fallow when it comes to security fixes you simply don't do it that's why you should not you should not be running a windows xp machine on the internet with any sensitive information on it that's why uh linux constantly even though it's an open source free operating system linux is constantly releasing security updates, as is uh, Mac OS and iOS 8. Android, is, I'll give Google credit, they are releasing the security fixes, but the fixes aren't making their way down to the hardware. There, because there's too many people in the chain. There's a potential solution for this if you know how to flash your own ROM, but then you're relying on someone else, some ROM maker on XDA forums who makes ROMs for your... You're relying on them not to have tampered with it, and yeah, that you're that's always tricky. This is going, and like Mike said, we're heading for a fall. We're heading for a serious, serious security issue to pop up with Android, and to especially with this one, with so many phones stuck maximum at marshmallow. People still using those phones, people not upgrading their phones, because why should they? And it's going to be a big hit that's going to affect all of these phones that can't upgrade, which are hundreds of thousands of, uh, maybe potentially millions right now, currently in people's hands. It's going to hit all these people, it's going to be a serious breach, and it's going to... No one's going to care about this whole carrier and provider and, and, and chipset maker. It's just going to fall straight into Google's lap. Yeah. And they're going to have, and I would like Google to take some initiative on this. And they just keep not doing that. So, you're right now, the, the only two options you have right now, if you want new good on your phone and, and you're not getting an update, buy a new phone, which again, that suits the chipset manufacturers and the hardware manufacturers just fine because you're spending more money, which they kind of want you to do because they're assholes. Yeah. Now, to, 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 to make a point here, this is not quite comparable to your computer at home. And the reason it's not is because while there are just as many possibly manufacturers for various components of your computer, 
they all seem to be in the mindset of, no, no, we need to security patch this stuff. Mm -hmm. So when Microsoft or Apple, for those people who use Macs, yeah. uh, issues a security patch and it breaks something, which does happen, um, they go, oh, we're going to fix that. Now, sometimes the software companies go, yeah, we can't fix that in our current product, but here's our new product, which you can upgrade to. Right. And they want you to pay money for it. The last time I recall that Microsoft did something like this was when they put out a, um, a series of patches that depreciated a bunch of code because that code would turn out to be insecure. And it had been insecure for about 15 years, and they yeah. just noticed it. And so they said, oh, shit, can't use that anymore. To the point I found out about it when I went to compile some code, and my compiler said, why the hell are you still using these functions? Those are bad functions. I'm like, oh, it's okay. It's getting to the point where as much as I do not like Apple, I don't like their business practices, I don't like them as a company, and their hardware is inferior in a lot of cases, I can't in good conscience recommend people not get an iPhone. Yeah, their security model is superior. Yeah. Which, of course, the FBI had problems with, but... Which is really pissing me off because I like Android. I like using Android. I've, I've been an Android user for as long as I've had a smartphone. I like having choice. I like having different price levels. I like all of those things. But that security issue is so important. It is, it's right up there at the top of the things people should be aware of. And, and for most... I think, it, I think it's going to take a congressional investigation or a congressional hearing to get someone to... to to suit up and take responsibility for it. For most of the people out there right now who don't know how to flash a ROM on Android, who don't know how to adjust shit on their phone, they just, they, they need it to work. I couldn't recommend them get an Android anymore. I just can't, not in good conscience. So that that is- Whereas that. You, could, you, you could recommend it for me because I do all that shit. Yeah, but it, it's, that's just seriously disappointing for me. Anyway, all right, time to move on to your questions where Mike and I attempt to resolve some tech issues for you. If you have questions, you can send those to requests at radiodeadair.com, and we will attempt to fix things for you. Um, I, think, I think one of these is a repeat from last time. Which one? Um, the last one from James. Really? Let me, let me look. Um, hang on. Yeah, okay. did we answer that question on the air? Because I send you more questions than we answer sometimes. I don't remember. I don't believe we answered this one on the air. Okay, that's it. That, that, that may be why. Um, this is from James. Hey, Nash and Mike, my sister's having a problem with her laptop. She thinks it has to do with the graphics card and wants to replace as a result, but I suspect it's due with the screen and the connections to the hardware. She has the Toshiba Satellite S50B15P, which is reporting the following symptoms. Black line randomly appearing on screen, the screen freezing momentarily and then being fine again, and some sort of error message being on the screen at times, especially unhelpful as I live far away from her. Um, says her Amazon video playback stops working sometimes too. Just the video, the page is fine. I realize this is very limited information to go on. It's all the information I've been told and can relay at this time. So I wonder if any of this rings any bells with you before I go ahead and change her graphics card, which she comes down next week. Okay, James. First problem here. Shit. Yeah, is the webcam slipped down? Yeah. First problem here, James, with replacing a laptop graphics card. You can. So get that one right out of the, uh, the list of things to do. Long, long ago, graphics cards and computers were actually a daughter board. That, that's what they refer to as a separate piece that connects straight to the motherboard. You have a motherboard and then a little other card was a daughter board. And, they, and video cards were separate little daughter boards. They stopped doing that over time and just hardwired, uh, ball so uh, soldered the uh, ball solder. That's a fun thing to say, ball solder. They ball yeah. soldered the graphics chip straight to the motherboard. Now, I will note, it depends on the laptop. If it's an old enough laptop, or if it's a special model laptop, because some of them still do have them as daughter cards, yeah. uh, then it's possible it's a replacement. Um, I agree I would check the connections between the the the, the chassis and the, and the monitor and make sure they're fine. But the screen freezing tells me 
it, it indicates to me it's probably not the connectors. No, the the black line sounds a little that that could connectors. be Irish. That could go either way. That could be a connector or it could be a graphics glitch somewhere along the line. Um, yeah, with with graphics, you're not going to be able to replace. I looked this one up. The Toshiba uh, satellite. No, that's a, that's a Radeon M. I believe M260. Where M stands for mobile, which is built in. It's an AMD uh, laptop to begin with. AMD processor on it. Um, so there is no replacing the graphics in this. Put that one right out of your, out of the side. That's that's not going to happen anymore. You're not. No. What graphics are on there is what's graphics are on there. That's the nasty things about laptops. Um, in this case, however, we have very limited information to work on. Um, this could be overheating is a potential possibility. You could take a can of compressed air and clean out the uh, air intake fans, maybe blast a whole bunch of crud out of there and see if that makes any difference. You could also see if the fan, how well the fan is spinning, if it's making yeah. noise. The fans are usually replaceable. So you may look into that. If you're willing to tear the entire laptop down to the, to the motherboard, yes, you can replace the fan. Um, well, it depends on the, on, on the computer again. my For example, my work laptops, to replace the fan on those is literally you pop off one panel, remove one screw, replace the fan, put in. But those are those are work laptops. They're very underpowered for you yeah. know anything other than office. And that is a smart design. I wish more manufacturers would go with that because it make one of the most easily, one of the most easy points of failure in any computer, any laptop, anything is the moving parts. Yeah, and I I would agree it's a smart design. However, I would then have to give credit to HP for making a smart design, and I can't do that. <laughs> it's, it's it's a moral imperative. Um, the next thing you could do is check the video drivers. Again, we don't we don't have a lot of information here. I would check to make sure you have the most recent AMD drivers for that yeah. gra for the graphics. It could because that could also be the operating system conflicting with something on the drivers. Uh, I've seen that plenty of times where you get screwy things that are intermittent, and you just go, "Well, what's happening? I don't know." And then you update the drivers, it goes away, and you're like, "Well, what the hell was that then?" And of course, we have the worst case scenario, which is wipe it and start over. Reset it back to factory settings and see if that resolves the issue. And of course, back up your data. Back up your, yes, always back up your data before you factory settings. So I'm sorry we couldn't offer a little bit more there, James. Um, but no, you can't change the graphics card. That's not an option here. All your, all your options are either uh, get some compressed air, blast out any dust, do some software fixes, or if none of those work, take it in for a repair, which is probably going to cost as much as replacing the laptop. I'm very sorry. If you get some more information about it, if you get some specific errors, go ahead and email those back to us, and we'll see if we can't tr track this down to be a little more more precise. Um, yeah, and that's a shame because it, 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 it's a relatively young laptop. Yeah. I'm looking at the model numbers here. Uh, let's. I mean, on. unless she got one as brand new, but you know, it, it it came out the day before she bought it. Let's let's move on to another Toshiba satellite related one, and this one kind of this is an annoying issue that pops up for so many people over the years. Um, this comes from Ryan. He says, "Good even Nash and the evil man that assaults my eardrums." I guess that's you. That's got it. Well, could be Grady. He's not a man. He's a floof. But he does assault the eardrums. He does. Uh, Ryan says, a few months ago, the hard drive of my Toshiba satellite L77 5D S7340 died. The other day, I was given a replacement hard drive, but I'm able, unable to find the system disk that should have come with my laptop to reinstall Windows. I contact. I tried to contact Toshiba, was told by an automated message that falls out of warranty, and I would be charged just for calling. They do this. Wow, that's that's pretty crappy. I realize this may fall under a gray area legally, but is there any way to get my hand on the disc, or am I just hosed? Um, before you suggest it, replacing the laptop is a dead last resort. Okay. A big problem that happens quite often, especially with a dead hard drive issue with laptops, is lots of laptops come are, are delivered right now with no discs. Your yeah. restore discs are actually built onto a separate partition on your laptop's hard drive. 
and there's a restore program you run through the, at boot up, you don't get a physical disk anymore. Or even if you have an older system, um, you may have misplaced the disk. They may be gone somewhere. And getting a new copy of them can cost you anywhere from fifty to two hundred dollars just for a copy of the disk, not a license. Just for a copy of the software you got. Now there is, so you don't have to have the Toshiba disk. No, you don't. You can use any Windows operating as long as you match the type that you had before and you have the serial number for your OS. Now, if we want to get into a legal way of doing this, here's how. For a long time, there was a company called Digital River that maintained an archive of official, non-tampered with, straight from Microsoft images of all the Windows disks, Windows 7, 8, all the rest of them. They stopped doing that, but there is a German archive of those disks as well. Now, here's what you're going to have to do. Uh, and let me take you to the website here. To, I'll show you. Um, well, Microsoft offers, offers free ISOs as well. For Windows 7? I think so. Do you have a link? Uh, I'll see. Okay. Um, he, I found this information on a site called PCSteps.com, which you can look up yourself. Um, and the title of the article, for help you, to help you Google it, if I can move the damn... Would, would you work? Would you stop? Would you, would, you, would you just stop, friend? Would you? There you go. Uh, the title of the article is Download Windows 7 ISOs uh, Free. Now, okay, I, I do have a link. Okay, where is it? The link is uh, www.microsoft.com mm -hmm. slash en dash us slash software dash download slash Windows 7. You will need to have your product key. Now, if your product key... That's that's the problem. That, 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 that's I, I noticed it in the same article. If you have a retail copy of Windows, yes, the product key will work on that page. Ah. He does not have a retail copy. He's got the... He's got OEM the copy from the laptop. It won't allow him to download... Now, now if you at home, if you if everyone else, if you're missing your Windows 7 disk, but you purchased a copy from a store or online and you have that product key, you're fine. You can download a new copy straight from Microsoft. But those of you with laptops, what you have is an OEM key. It's slightly different. It's made to install on many machines at once. It's a bulk product key. And Microsoft regards that differently. So you can't download a new copy from Microsoft. Yeah, but my apologies, folks. If you go to PC Steps, and uh, look for download Windows 7 ISOs legally and for free. It will give you the links to the sites. What you'll need, however, because this is legal. I will point out this is perfectly legal because while you'll have a copy of the software, an official Microsoft image straight from them, untouched, no spyware, no, no pirate crap in there, what you require to make this work is a license key. So without a license key, the copy of Windows 7 is absolutely useless. Now you will need to have your license key to do a reinstall. And you'll see a um, sticker that looks much like this. It says uh, OEM, whatever, and it's got all this stuff. And it will list the product key. It's normally a sticker on the bottom of your laptop. However, those stickers rub off, they wear away, the product number gets faded. The next, if, if that's the case, you'll need another little piece of software to help you out on this one. Um, it's called Magical Jelly Bean. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what it's called. It's, you can find that at- well, All the good names were taken. Yeah, you can find that at magicaljellybean.com. It's a free piece of software uh, called Product Key Finder. You can download it and it will tell you the product keys for not just Windows 7, uh, where's Windows 8, Office 2010, uh, Adobe CS2 through CS6, a bunch of different uh, software if you need to have a copy of your product keys and you don't have it. 
Once you have that product key and you've downloaded the image file of Windows 7, you can make your own DVD or you can make a USB key and you can reinstall Windows 7 that way. It's legal, you're not breaking the law, you own a valid license for that machine to run Windows 7 and your product key will work with it. As long as you match up, make sure you don't uh, get the wrong copy. For example, Windows 7 came in a 32-bit version and a 64-bit version. There's the home version, there's the premium version, there's the ultimate version. Make sure you have the right version of Windows, 32-bit or 64-bit, and then your product key, once you get it from uh, Magical Jelly Bean, it will work. Now, you may be asking yourself, of course, how can I trust this, this site? It has a legit ISO of Windows, and it's not chock full of, you know, crapware, yeah. viruses, and things. It's because they give the MD5 checksum and and hash values for these files, which you can compare to the Microsoft ones. They say here's the list of Microsoft ones, yep. you know, and you can go to Microsoft and look at them, the numbers, and go this matches, and you can compare. You can run this test on your computer. Go what is the MD5 value of this file? Right. And this is a hashing thing. It's basically a very complex computer algorithm that runs on a file that says, I, I run complex computer math on the file and come back with a number. And even if that, if that file differed as little as one byte in one deep location in there, it would come back with a completely different number. Um, so yeah. But theoretically. Theoretically, MD5 can be broken, but not something this big is uh, very unlikely to make something they can match. So hopefully that will get you back up and running. That will provide you with a new copy of Windows and you can just move on from there. Good luck. Um, next up comes from, let's do Will's question because I think this is going to be a fairly short one. Will says, this isn't much a tech support question, this is a tech disposal question. See, I've collected a few PCs, which has led to me gaining three or four hard drives that are completely irrevocably dead and are just sitting there collecting dust. So what are, what are my options for recycling or better yet, selling these dead drives? Well, if they're, if they're, if they're dead that are completely uh, irre irrevocably dead, I don't know anyone who's going to want to buy them. No. Except, except perhaps there might be a recycling center in your area that will take them and pay you a little bit of money for them. But that's iffy at best. I mean, you're more likely to get more money out of taking your soda cans. You could eBay them as dead for parts. Maybe get 10 bucks per drive if you're lucky. Yeah. However, Will, don't do this. Please don't do this. Because while the hard drive may be dead, the platters may be intact. Yes. Their data could still be on there. Um... If you know someone with a bulk degausser, which is kind of unlikely, yeah, I would have it run through that, then run through that before you dispose of them. Do not, and I'm serious here, this is not one of my joking do nots, do not think, oh, I can use my microwave as a bulk degausser. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> it will explode. It's a bad idea. Pretty much what you're saying is you've collected these these computers, and I'm thinking they're from uh, other people, or even maybe even yourself. Um, the way a hard drive works is it has a little scanning read needle, kind of like a record player, that met, that runs over met these magnetic platters, looking for dips and grooves and valleys. It doesn't actually come in contact with them. It just reads over them and, and sees the magnetic value of these, of, of the platters. And even if the mechanisms in the drive are no longer functioning... And this, ha this is actually how a lot of hard drive recovery companies do this. You get a, say, a similar model drive. You lift out the platters. You un unscrew the old drive. Pull it apart carefully in a controlled environment. Lift the platters out of one drive and put them into a new one with working mechanisms. Yeah. Then you can now, read the data. Now, if you take this drive, your, your, your drive and you can shake it and you hear a sound like shattered pieces inside. That one, okay, no one's going to worry about trying to recover the data on that one. That Those platters are gone. Yeah, it's in this case, though, I, I really wouldn't. It's, if they're your hard drives and it's yours to risk, sure, if you want to maybe give those away, okay. But if they're not your drives, 
No, because you're potentially just handing over other people's private information to the yeah. to uh, ran, Don't 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 do this. Now, now realistically, is the, the risk that great? Not necessarily. Um, if you're looking to dispose of them, I would see what electronics disposals are. Uh, places are in your area your yeah. yellow pages may have an ex a, a section possibly yeah what i would do with the hard drives you don't have to this, do this with other components necessarily unless they're data storage devices as well yeah. is i would take a nice nice heavy hammer and hit the drive a few times to break up the platters right but if that's just if, if you don't know someone with a bulk degausser yeah but look at you're not going to get any real yeah money there's no, no no real money for them if they were working i would say do a low level format on them and then you could sell them, you know, because the, the, there's programs out there. This is for everyone, by the way. There's programs out there easily download where you can plug in your hard drive and tell it to do a government level reformat of the drive, right. which uh, uh, rewrites the drive multiple times and then erases it down to a ground state. And I would say, even though we use that at work, when we dispose of a drive, you know what we do? Drill holes we, take it? It to, we take it to a hammer mill and it gets smashed to small pieces. Uh, we'll go with one. Which reminds me, I've got a box of hard drives at work, and I need to take the hammer mill. <laughs> got a last one here from Sid. We'll handle this one tonight. Um, hey, Mike and Nash. Not too long ago, I managed to snag a computer that was being uh, retired by my university, already wiped clean, and I'm hoping to use it for a server, possibly for a website. Found some helpful articles in this process, but still very new for me. I'm wondering if either of you had any advice for how to go about it. Okay, well, the first thing I would do is check whatever your ISP's rules are for mm -hmm. attaching a server to your network. Um, some of them are very, very picky about such things. Others aren't. Yeah. Um, and it depends because what they don't want is you running a business type thing on a residential connection because you're not paying them enough money then. Right, That that that's why Comcast has their business class and their consumer business class. If you're on business class, you could run any damn thing you want on there as long as it's not, you know, legal. You know, as long as it's legal and whatnot, you can run any kind of web server off that as long as, you know, their service is worth a damn. Google Fiber, um, I, I'm not entirely sure on what their rules on this are, but I th they, even they are a little bit concerned about you running home web servers. I think that they're, they're looser than Comcast, though. They are looser than Comcast. Um, but, in, yeah, you, do check and make sure you've got the right one. Um, now, as for how you would set it up, I would suggest looking at Linux. Uh, even, especially if you're a first-timer and you've never done this sort of thing before, your easiest, friendliest, softest way to get into this would be Ubuntu Server Edition. Yes. And the reason I suggest this is because the Microsoft equivalent stuff for setting up websites is a pain in the ass Windows to deal with. Windows Server is a nightmare. Not just because it's expensive. It's because everything you think you know about Windows doesn't quite work the same way under Windows Server. Mo Whereas Ubuntu has lots of walkthroughs. And there'll be 9 million people on the internet willing to, or have, who have already written every kind of tutorial yeah. for anything you ever want to do. The Ubuntu server underneath it, pretty much underneath every flavor of Linux, is still Linux. All the, all Ubuntu and the different flavors are is they put little layers on top of it and user interfaces. At its base core, it's all Linux, which most... So sort, of, sort of like phone branding, right. but in this case, the security patches all come through. Most of the internet you you know, most of the websites you visit, most of the places you go online, their underpinnings are based on Linux, either an Apache web server or some other variety thereof. Linux makes the internet work. Some sites use Windows Server if, you know, they're masochists. Um, but the underpinnings of the... Uh, the reason I recommend Ubuntu is it's, it's, it's easy mode Linux, essentially. Um, it's absolutely free. Won't cost you a dime. You can download a copy online and install it. The only and they have they have they've guaranteed uh, long term support of the current version of server until April twenty twenty one. Which is so you've got a few years that you can go. I, I know I'll be able to get something out of this. The only other thing that crops to mind about using this system as a server is memory. Um. There are two kinds of RAM. Well, at least for what we're talking about here. ECC and non-ECC. 
And that stands for it's air correction code or air correction chipset. I think so. Um, here's the thing about RAM. Non-ECC RAM is what's used in most consumer devices. Your home desktop, your laptop, all these uses non-error correction because it's not as vital. If the RAM in, in your desktop starts to fail, oh well, go out and replace a new RAM chip. But if a RAM in a server starts to fail, that could bring down not only a server, but a whole website, a lot of critical stuff. What error correction does is, and I'm broadly generalizing this, so um, it routes around the damage in the yes. RAM. The downside of this is error correction RAM is slower, which makes a big impact when you're using a desktop, which is, I mean, you'd be sitting there, well, why is it all RAM ECC? It's more expensive and it's slower because it will slow down your desktop performance, slow down game performance, all of that stuff. But for a server, you don't need super fast performance. Most servers run on a command line interface, honestly. Um, so it doesn't even need to worry about running all that stuff. It just needs to have capacity and power. Yeah. Now, that said, ECC is only... Okay, so yeah, it's 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 nice for servers. It's great for servers. It's unless you're doing a lot of financial processing, you shouldn't necessarily have a problem with it. Right. I mean, if you're just going, if you're just thinking of a fan site, you'll probably be okay. Yeah. Understand. Just understand that if if your RAM goes down, and, and you're going to be running this, if you want your site to stay up constantly, the computer has to stay up constantly. The server you're making is going to have to stay up constantly, which means. It, the fans are going to be running constantly. The hard drive may be running a lot more than normally would with a computer, uh, and that RAM is going to be engaged a lot of time. It's going to be it's going to be getting about twice to three times as much wear and tear on it as a normal desktop computer would. Because you go away from a desktop, you shut it down, or you put it into sleep mode, and it, it conserves all this. So it's going to be taking a lot lot more wear and tear. If you're cool with all that, though. And after, because this was a windfall for you anyway. I mean, this you just got this from the university. If you're cool with all that, then just throw in Ubuntu server and follow some tutorials, and you should be on your way. It shouldn't even cost you a dime to set up. Of course, like Mike said, check with your internet provider because if you do set up a server and it's against their terms of service, they could shut you down. Not just your server, but your internet altogether. Yeah. Now, again, when I say when I say check with your ISP, it's it's going to be on their website somewhere. Yeah, but well, um, they may disallow some kinds of servers and allow others. If you say I have a server just to download patches and distribute to the nine computers I have in the house, they're probably okay with that because that's actually saving them bandwidth. Yeah. Um, but if you if you if you were doing a business, they they want you to be on a business contract. Yeah. If you're, you know, I. I there's, there's lots of reasons to have servers. And some of them are, are legit and the ISPs are or fine with. They have no. Another, some are legit and they're not fine with. And some are not legit and they're definitely not fine with. Another, another thing that they don't have, another type they don't have a problem with, a NAS server, which is a, a network attached storage server, which yeah. lets you access. You set up a computer in your home with set drives on it and all your other devices can access that one server with the drives on it and they're fine with that. They're, they're absolutely fine with that. that. That's that's a regular type of thing. So And yeah, they can detect yeah. sort of what's going on. Because they can go, well, this computer is getting a lot of traffic. What's there? Yeah, they, and they can they can ping it and go, what services are you running? They they do they do monitor that stuff. It's a little scary. And we're, not, we're, not say, we're not saying we're not saying we're not saying you can't do it. Just check first. Just check. Because it's 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 easier to check. It is not easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission. Because they don't ISP, give, no. yeah. With an ISP, they don't give a shit. If you if you kept some some brand new pr pr uh, purpose for a server, and they were going, well, what are you doing? Then they, they there'd probably be someone there who's interested enough, especially if your ISP was Google, to go, well, what is you're doing? To to be and you know permission there, but forgiveness there, but yeah. 
Well, that is going to do it again for this edition. Um, folks, thank you for uh, watching and for your questions. If you have a question you'd like Mike and I to take a crack at, send that to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will look and see what we can do out helping you out there. But in court, um, but for now, uh, until next time, uh, I'm Nash. This is Mike. We'll see you back here uh, next time. Yeah. Bye, everybody.